Asia's monarchies defy history. In a modern era of democracy, worlds of tradition, mystery, and ritual command fascination and respect like never before. Monarchies are symbols of continuity, living connections to the past that are often loved and loathed in equal measure. In Bhutan, the Himalayan kingdom they call the land of the thunder dragon, the past is very much alive in the present. And this clash has led to the most monumental change in their history. It was a profound shock. The king gave up absolute power and brought in democracy. It was the latest astute political move by the kings of Bhutan, the Wangchuk dynasty. To outsiders, Bhutan seems a Buddhist kingdom, but inside, there lies a different tale. The story of Wang Chuk is one of intrigue, power struggles, and political genius. Bhutan is a tiny country, lying in the mountains and valleys of the mighty Himalayas. A country of extraordinary beauty, steeped with myth and legend, seemingly untouched by the passing of time. It is known to the few visitors from the outside world as the last Shangri-La, and to its people as Drukyul, land of the thunder dragon. Like so much in Bhutan, its name arrived from an ancient legend. Almost a thousand years ago, a Tibetan monk came to Bhutan to found a new monastery. As he laid the final stone, he heard a sound that seemed to him God's blessing on his work. A huge roar rushed down the valley, like a roar of a dragon, a thunder dragon. And perhaps this image of a ferocious creature is a clue to Bhutan's survival. Once, the Himalayas was covered by a mosaic of small kingdoms, just like Bhutan. One by one, they have disappeared. Now, Bhutan is the only monarchy left in the region. There's a sense in Bhutan that there has to be something very steely, a kind of bottom line about the nation's survival. That, can't, that has to be ruthless if it needs to be. But there can be no compromise on certain things. Its survival is down to the Wangchuks. Each of the Wangchuk kings has faced a crisis during their reign. Each of them has averted it with a shrewd political move. The first king, Ugyen Wangchuk, founded the new monarchy and united Bhutan after years of infighting. The second king, Jigme Wangchuk, faced down a centuries-old rival to his throne and cemented the Wangchuks as undisputed rulers. The third king took Bhutan into the United Nations, ensuring its ultimate survival as an independent state. The fourth king would prove to be the most far-sighted member of the dynasty. Ruling Bhutan has always been a game of politics and survival, and one that the Wangchuks play well. And these skills are passed down from father to son as though monarchy is a family business and politics their currency. The upbringing of the Wangchuk kings is the formula for their personal success. No one knows better than Michael Rutland a former English schoolteacher recruited to come to Bhutan as the fourth king's tutor in 1971. These days, he's retired and living in Bhutan, working as the country's envoy to the UK. Today, he's come to visit the school with a former pupil and classmate of the fourth king. 
here we are in the Ugyen Wangchuk Academy, and this was built in 1970 by the then Queen of Bhutan as the school for the young crown prince, who was then 15. It made no difference that one of them was the crown prince of Bhutan. He blended in totally with all the other pupils. I think that time it didn't strike us, so it was just like a bunch of 20 people and His Majesty. I, went all, the, all out, I think, to show that uh, there, there were no differences. He was uh, very considerate uh, and very compassionate already and uh, very caring towards us as a, um, as a, as a friend and as a, as a person. It's a very good upbringing. Uh, the kings from very young age, the future king, have been going with their fathers all the time. They are not isolated from their father. They are staying with their father and they are looking at how the father, their father deal and take decision. The fourth king, Jigmi Singye Wangchuk, made a momentous decision that was to change the role of the monarchy forever. He willingly stood down from absolute rule and delivered democracy to his people and one that his young son, the new king, must now oversee. Here in Timpu, the capital and seat of politics, these changes are most keenly felt. The people see the Wangchuks as both wise and benevolent rulers who have safely led the country through many changes. Small wonder they view democracy with apprehension. It was a profound shock. I think it's fair to say that in the 12 months following the King's announcement, if you had taken a public opinion poll, you would have had a 99.9999% vote in favour of maintaining rule by the Kings. Feelings remain that the Kings of Bhutan can never be replaced by politicians. To be frank, I don't like democracy. I like under monarchs. In democracy, I've seen in many countries, especially our neighboring uh, country like India. There are so many trouble going on we are with uh, one nation, one people. We love our king very much. Uh, we, uh, we consider him as the second Buddha. There are two things that unite the people of Bhutan, their reverence for the kings and their devotion to Buddhism. The religious values of Buddhism are everywhere to be seen, from prayer flags to spiritual monuments. I think uh, the Bhutanese way of life, uh, it's very difficult to really uh, separate Bhutanese culture from, from Buddhism. Everything in life that Bhutanese believe and Bhutanese do as a way of life is very much influenced by you know, Buddhist principles and uh, way of thinking. Today, there is a total solar eclipse, which happens here only once every 370 years. This makes it a very auspicious day. Religion and superstition are brought to the forefront. Spiritual rituals are held to ward off the evil spirits that the Bhutanese believe are eating the sun. And of course, prayers are said for the royal family. Tabamiki, 
Nearby in the house of the village elder, butter lamps are lit as they are every morning and with special care today. A whole room, half the upper floor, is set aside as a shrine, common in nearly all Bhutanese homes. And right next door, in equal prominence, is a room dedicated to the kings. And this is not by chance. The Wangchuks were quick to cloak themselves in a national religion, recognizing the power of uniting the concepts of God with the crown. The indelible link between religion and the monarchy was a key part in Bhutan's history and the story of the kings. But the image of a wise and brilliant dynasty handing out blessings to the people is only part of the picture. Like every monarchy, there is a dark side. Their rise to power was at the cost of others, for they were not the only rulers to have walked these valleys. Bhutan was once home to priest kings, Tibetan princes, and exiled monks. To understand the Wangchuk's rise to power, you have to understand the history behind them. Bhutan's royal family is a riddle. The roots of power in this perplexing and mysterious land runs deep. Bhutan's monarchy is barely a century old, but they owe their position to a history of former rulers and foreign influences that stretches back over a thousand years. Bhutan's geographical position has played a huge role in its history. It is dwarfed between India to the south and China and Tibet to the north. It was exiles and refugees from these neighbors who were to introduce new ideas that would shape Bhutan's future. One of the first and most important of these foreign visitors was a Buddhist tantric master known as Guru Rinpoche, who arrived from India in 747 AD. Legend has it that he flew into Bhutan on the back of a tiger. He came here and brought Buddhism to Bhutan for the first time. And so a very significant character. Uh, you, the image you see of him there, uh, you can recognize that it's Guru Rinpoche, first of all, because of the uh, headgear, secondly, the little mustache, and thirdly, uh, in his right hand, he carries a dorji or a thunderbolt, and in his left hand, a staff with three skulls on them. Guru Rinpoche established Mahayana Buddhism as the dominant religion of Bhutan. It's been at the heart of the nation throughout its history. Rinpoche is referred to as the second Buddha in Bhutan. Eight hundred years later, another foreign refugee was to flee to Bhutan. In 1616, a lama, Ngawang Namgyal, arrived in Bhutan seeking refuge from the political crisis in Tibet. He went on to become the spiritual leader of Bhutan. After a series of victories over rival subsect leaders, he took on the title of Shabdrung, meaning at whose feet one submits. The Shabdrung may have been a monk, but he had definite political plans for Bhutan, plans that would directly lead to the rise of the Wangchuk kings. Well, the, the Shabdrung's, the original Shabdrung, Ngawang Namgyal, was obviously a, a pretty charismatic guy. Uh, came down as a refugee from, from Tibet, established his rule, this, this 
this Drukpa Kagyu sect of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, built these huge fort monasteries in, in each of the major valleys, the Dzongs that you can still see today. So established a, an infrastructure and a, and a system of government that, that worked for the, for the country. Dzongs, vast fortified monasteries placed at strategic points throughout the country by the Shabdrong. It provided islands of security in a land under constant threat from its neighbors on all sides. Although the Shabdrong oversaw the network of Tsongs across the country, it was the Penlop, or Lord of the Tsong, who controlled it as both a military and economic headquarters. And one Tsong in particular was to become increasingly powerful in later years, setting the stage for the rise of the Wangchuks, who were destined to become lords of this powerful fortress. This Zong of Trongsa is one of the most impressive Zongs in Bhutan. It was built in 1650 in the time of the Shabdrung, and it was the means by which the whole of the east of Bhutan was brought under the Shabdrung's control. Not only were these Zongs politically important, they were money spinners as well. Each was placed at the head of a vital trade route, and where there is trade, there is taxation. This great powerful river, the Mang Di Chu, is in a way a key to the economic power of this Zong, because there was only one bridge across that river, and you had to cross the one bridge and then walk up a path which inevitably led you into one door of the Zong, so there was no way you could get by or slip through secretly. And of course, it meant that you had to pay your taxes. There was no way around the taxation. So this made this Zong immensely powerful and rich. And it was the power of these Zong lords that would soon become a threat to the Shabdrung's rule. To maintain the Shabdrung's leadership, he needed to establish a line of succession, his own dynasty. As a Buddhist, he believed he would be reincarnated again and again and again. He would effectively succeed himself. It was this Buddhist concept that he believed would provide the answer to maintaining his rule. However, when he died in 1651, his court was left with a major problem, finding the reincarnated Shabdrung in his new body. His death wasn't, wasn't made public for 50 years or whatever because of the, the fears of uh, the risks of uh, conflict over the succession. There was a dual system of, of temporal and spiritual authority, but the question of succession became increasingly fractious. Um, into the 19th century, uh, Bhutan was in a condition of almost civil war for, for many, many years. The Shabdrung's leadership in Bhutan continued to weaken. In contrast, the lords of the Tsongs would consolidate their own positions, growing in power throughout the 19th century. But it was the lords of the two greatest Tsongs who saw their chance. The lords of Paro in the west, and the lords of Trongsa in the east, the Wangchuks. It was during this time that the might of the British Empire turned its sights on this tiny kingdom. At the beginning of the 20th century, the British feared a Russian threat from the north and wanted to get to Tibet to establish an Anglo-Tibetan alliance. Ugin Wangchuk, who became the first Wangchuk king, acted as an aid and an interpreter and a guide to the British as they invaded Tibet, or as the expeditionary force went into Tibet, gained the support and the favor of the British, was very well thought of by the British. The Anglo-Tibetan Convention of 1904 was secured, and Ugyen Wangchuk was knighted for his service to the empire. This further cemented his power, and he was able to put an end to the Shabdrung system of rule. He then took control of the civil administration of Bhutan. 
In 1907, an assembly of Buddhist monks and government officials gathered to establish a new absolute monarchy, with Ugyen Wangchuk as its first hereditary king. It is the wisdom of people that they came together in 1907 and they said, here is a man who's been tested through his family and through his service, his love for the nation and his bravery for protecting the country. So they elected him. He was absolutely, I think he was a consummate diplomat. Yes, although he was often barefoot, he was a consummate diplomat. <laughs> and in a great gathering, at uh, Punakar in 1907, the, the Genja, the, the decree, the contract, was, was agreed and signed by all the, all the local rulers across Bhutan. So this great Trong Sezong became the seat of power, the focus of power for the beginning of monarchy. The new king had won his throne by his strength as a political genius. But to truly govern his kingdom, he needed the devotion of the people, the sort of devotion they had for the Shabdrung lineage, the spiritual leaders. So in one deceptively simple move, he united the concept of God and king like his predecessors before him, literally by uniting the crown with the ultimate symbol of the Shabdrung's divinity, the raven. The raven um, is a symbol of the, the Buddhist deity Mahakala. Ngam, uh, Ngamang the I Shabdrung is supposed to have decided to, to leave Tibet and move to, to Bhutan when he saw a raven flying sort of portentously in that particular direction, hence the association of the raven with the Shabdrung with Bhutan. The Wangchuk kings wear a raven crown. So there's a, there's a coming together of the two lineages which means that the, the possibility of a threat arising to the Wangchuks from the, the Shabdrung lineage is minimized by absorbing it symbolically. The raven crown provided spiritual legitimacy to its rule, but he still had to subdue final rebellions from other Zong lords. Ogen Wangchuk spent the next 20 years uniting Bhutan until his death in 1926. He was succeeded by his son, Jigme Wangchuk. During his reign, Bhutan's Zongs were brought under royal control once and for all. Bhutan was finally at peace, for now at least. The new king was free to set about winning the hearts and minds of his subjects. He did this by building new palaces in the kingdom visiting them regularly to ensure he kept in touch with his people. So this is Kungarabton Palace, which was the winter palace of the second king. It was built in 1932 and lived in all the way through until the second king died in 1952. The king would come in grand procession from his main palace, hundreds of horses, hundreds of servants descending down the hill, arriving here in the palace for the winter residence of the king and his queen. And the whole village would liven up. Nebu Doji was a young boy when the second king built his winter palace in the village. His annual residency was a party that involved the whole village.
Their status as absolute rulers and their efforts to appeal to the people did not guarantee the security of the Wangchuk dynasty. The Bhutan royal family suffered from questions of legitimacy during the early years of rule, with the reincarnations of the various Shabdrungs posing a threat. It would prove the greatest challenge yet to the Dragon Throne, but it would also show just what the Wangchuks were capable of when its supremacy was threatened. In 1931, the monarchy of Bhutan had been ruling for just 24 years, but they were not the only group with an appetite for power in the Dragon Kingdom. Jigme Wangchuk had been on the throne for just five years when the threat of the reincarnated Shabdrung re-emerged. Jigme Dorji, the sixth Shabdrung, challenged the Wangchuk's right to rule. There was an appeal made to Mahatma Gandhi in India by, by the, the then Shabdrung and his supporters to reinstate him to his former position. But in 1931, the upshot of this was that the, the Shabdrung was quietly done away with. Um, the, the popular story has it using silk scarves. And this is actually recounted. This was always something that the Bhutanese sort of knew about, but didn't speak of very much, or other kind of dark secret in the country's history. But it has actually been written about now by one of the queens in her biography of her father. It was a bold act. They dealt with the challenge decisively in true Wang Chuk fashion. And for the next two decades, the second king ruled peacefully. In 1952, he died, and his son, Jigme Dorji Wangchuk, ascended to the dragon throne. Like his father and grandfather before him, the third king was to face a huge crisis that threatened his throne. When China took over Tibet in 1951, communism was at Bhutan's door. To the Bhutanese, who worked on land they didn't own and had no rights to, Communism seemed an attractive idea. The third king acted swiftly. He sided with his powerful neighbors to the south, and at home, he initiated a series of reforms. The king started reforms on a grand scale. He did the land reform, which was a huge thing. He took the land from the monk body, who was very, which was very rich, and then he redistributed also the land of the monk body. That was, I mean, agrarian reform is one of the boldest moves you can make. The alliance with India provided support for Bhutan's planned economic development. Modern infrastructure like roads, communication systems were built, mostly funded by India. And in 1966, the third king made Timpu the capital city of Bhutan. So the third king, of, uh, who was ruling at the time, is, is still seen universally as a very enlightened and far-sighted ruler who was perhaps ahead of demands for change in his own country. The third king's modernization program helped prevent any plans China may have had to continue its expansion beyond the Himalayan ground. Once again, the king of Bhutan had secured his country's independence. In 1971, Bhutan was admitted to the United Nations. The UN membership further strengthened its sovereign status. That was a seal which guaranteed the independence of Bhutan. But he didn't just stop there. As Bhutan connect, became connected with the outside world, Bhutan would have to change inside as well. He instituted the National Assembly. He realized that people needed to be involved more in their own government. That was the very first step towards the constitutional democracy. During Jigme Dorji Wangchuk's 20-year reign, Bhutan achieved significant progress. The third king was affectionately known as the father of modern Bhutan. He died young at age 49. It put his son, Jigme Singye Wangchuk, on the dragon throne in 1972, at the age of just 17. I mean, you imagine, he was 17. He was a kid playing football. And suddenly, he's a king. 
And from the start, the false king had been completely committed to Bhutan and its people and to help Bhutan to change and modernize without giving up the uniqueness of the tradition and what makes Bhutan. Bhutan hit the world headlines in 1972 when the fourth king introduced an unusual national policy. The country's wealth was not to be measured in money, but in gross national happiness. Gross national happiness is now part of Bhutan's brand. Political leaders who want to appear radical come to Bhutan, hoping that some of the political magic will rub off on them. Economists and planners the world over have attempted to formalize and measure gross national happiness and apply it outside Bhutan. It's a mantra that is as much mocked as it is worshipped. Bhutan's politicians have to fight hard to keep it meaningful and relevant to the country's progress. We interpret happiness as not as pleasure as it is widely interpreted, but as a much more profound sense of contentment, which lies inside. That's where you look inside. If you accept that, uh, gross national happiness, therefore, becomes a responsibility of the government or a mandate of the state to create an environment where citizens can pursue happiness. That's, in essence, gross national happiness. Bhutan had successfully sold an image of itself to the outside world as a Buddhist Eden, the land of happiness. But inside, it was facing an identity crisis about what it meant to be Bhutanese. Bhutan is an ethnically very mixed country. There are three main ethnic groups and lots of minor ones. No one group has an absolute majority in, in, in terms of their, their numbers. The, the Ngalong are the people of the north and west of the country from which the king um, comes and the, most of the ruling class. The population along the southern border of the country is mainly of Nepali origin and are relatively recent immigrants. Probably came to the country between 1865 and 1930. This ethnic mix had not been seen as a problem until a large population of Nepalese speakers from the south started to gain influence throughout Bhutanese society. In 1991, the king and his ministers immediately moved to try to preserve the specific culture and identity of Bhutan. And suddenly, almost very quickly, over a, a number of about a year, a whole lot of legislation came in about marriage, citizenship, land ownership, and then uh, the wearing of uh, Bhutanese national costume in official places. Even today, school children wear the national dress. For men, it is the go. It goes back centuries as the formal attire of the dragon court. Bhutan's Drukpa heritage is part of its national identity, reinforced by the monarchy and the upper crust of Bhutanese society. I think it was very, very important that His Majesty the Fourth King did this to uh, inculcate into our youth and our future generations that, hey, we can't lose our culture to a gene culture. We must be Bhutanese, first and foremost. Irrespective of what part of the country you come from, we must all now think to be Bhutanese. To maintain your culture, respect your culture, your religion, your elders, respect for elders, but teachers, this, our, our Bhutanese Buddhist values. I think those are the, the value systems which keep us going. Despite all these measures, it was still felt that the purity of Bhutanese culture and identity was under threat. Their answer was to hold the census. It defined how Bhutanese you were. If you weren't Bhutanese enough, you had to leave. Nin 19, in 1988, the, the government of Bhutan conducted a census across the whole of the South, and a large number of people who had considered themselves to be full citizens with citizenship cards and so on became less secure in their minds about their right to remain in Bhutan. 
and these directly targeted the Nepalese speakers in the south. When this political tension erupted, large numbers of them were afraid, either because a member of their family had been arrested and they didn't know where they were, or because they were being harassed by security forces from the Bhutanese government who was telling them, leave the country. And also because they were coming under severe pressure from their own kind to take part in demonstrations and activities against the Bhutanese government and were being coerced with threats and you know, with violence from there. So people were caught in the middle. In the three years after the census, the southern Nepalese began to flee to refugee camps in Nepal. 1991, 1992, but at the peak of this migration, around 600 people a day arrived in refugee camps in, in Nepal. They brought with them their tales of torture, rape and violence by the Bhutanese authorities. At first, the international community gave little credence to these horror stories. They could not believe that Bhutan, the last Shangri-La, was capable of such violence. However, the sheer number of refugees involved meant the evidence was compelling. One-sixth of the population had been forced out of the country and into these camps. The world could no longer ignore these human rights abuses. The potential consequences for the Dragon Throne couldn't have been more serious. How was the king going to deflect this outrage and regain the support of the international community that his tiny kingdom relied on. Like his forefathers before him, he faced a grave crisis, and like them, he played a political masterstroke. The Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan counts itself blessed. Its people have enjoyed an unprecedented century of peace and stability, and they thank their monarchs, the five kings, for wise and clear-minded rule. Bhutan's guiding economic philosophy is world famous. It's called gross national happiness, and it puts an emphasis on the Buddhist principles of finding contentment without material pleasure. But the Kingdom of Thunder Dragon has found itself buffeted by many challenges in its 400-year history. Threats from its giant neighbors and internal division being just a few. In the last decades of the 20th century, it wasn't war or religion that shook Bhutan, but ethnic politics and global opinion. The enforced removal of the Nepali-speaking population had shocked the world. The king faced international condemnation. It also shone the spotlight on Bhutan's system of royal rule. Every day he sat on the throne as an absolute monarch, the Bhutan brand was being further damaged. But in typical Wangchuk fashion, he had a plan. In the background, he had been slowly modernizing Bhutan's political system. He would change the monarchy from absolute rulers to a constitutional monarchy and so bring democracy to his people. It's another example of the Wang Chuk kings being very shrewd, seeing the way the wind is blowing and taking a step, perhaps ahead of being forced to do so. Throughout the 1990s, he strengthened the powers of the democratic organizations, and in 1998, even gave the cabinet the power to sack him. Strangely, the greatest obstacle to the introduction of democracy was the people themselves. Discussions really boiled down to people saying, please, no. We asked two very important questions. Why? And the king's own answer really was that, you know, this small, vulnerable country should not be left in the hands of one man, one person who is uh, chosen by birth, not by merit. There can't be many places where the king has encouraged, almost, you might say, forced, 
but encouraged the people to accept democracy and to take power away from him. And there can be even fewer countries where the king or the ruler has actually traveled the country explaining all this to the people in order to give them time to get used to the concept. In many countries in South Asia and other parts of the world, I think interpret democracy as a, just electoral democracy, you know, the facade, without the culture of democracy. And it's, and it's synonymous with uh, political violence, with uh, political corruption. So the people are saying, why? You know, I mean, it was a genuine response, really, saying, why do we want that? Things are going well. Bhutan was in shock. In the space of a year, a draft constitution had been published, promising freedom of thought and speech, creating a multi-party democracy, and even a mandatory retirement age for the king, 65. It came as a terrible shock to the people. It was as if father had let go of the hand of the child and the child was not sure which way to move. It was a profound shock. But there were more shocks to come. In 2005, just six months after the constitution had been published, the fourth king made another announcement. In uh, uh, 2005, when during the National Day celebrations in December, the king gave his National Day speech and said that he would be stepping down and the crown prince would be made king. I mean, it was hard for us to believe, believe that, you know, believe such a, such a moment. You know, to me, when I think about it, it's like the father had achieved his destiny and the son was beginning his. Within the space of a couple of years, the fourth king had brought in a new constitution, set in motion the first ever elections and stepped down from his throne. It seemed his legacy to his son, Jigme Kesa Namgyal Wangchuk, was a new Bhutan for a new era. And as the former king placed the raven crown on his son's head, the whole country looked to the future. It's very special. It's first of all 100 years of monarchy and the first coronation in my life, actually. That's why it's very special. You know, first time in my life I'm seeing a king being crowned. It's really wonderful to see a king or a leader so in touch with their people and so caring about their, their people. Well, the king will always be special to us, uh, no matter whether the, you know, the government changes into a democracy or it's a, a monarchy. The king will always be special to Bhutanese people. Why? Because we love the king. That's the simple answer I can give. Politically, it is a young country with a young king at its helm only 28 years old. The fifth king faces a whole new set of challenges. Bhutan is taking its first steps towards embracing the 21st century. The first was to oversee the inaugural elections in Bhutan, with a population that approached democracy with suspicion. People are a bit apprehensive because we have seen ourselves that uh, you know, democracy, of course, is not the best form of government, you know. It, it just basically, I think, broadens your choice of governance, you know, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee prosperity. It doesn't necessarily guarantee, you know, happiness. It's a democracy in the sense that people vote. It's not a full democracy in the sense that when they vote, they can only really vote for two parties. And when we look at the, the leadership of the parties, they're clearly people still who are close to the royal family and, and the palace. So the dirty business of politics is left to others. The introduction of the democratic system was carefully managed by the fourth king in order to maintain the revered status of the monarchy and the relevance of the king's position in today's world. I think in terms of um, providing emotional and uh, psychological security to the people uh, in times when even Bhutanese democracy may go through upheavals. I think uh, the king will play a very important role, as he does even now. But at the same time, he, the king, does not interfere in the, uh, the direct governance of uh, the country. But he is there. He will always be there, a presence that will also ensure that those who are in power 
conduct themselves well in the larger interest of the people. I think he will always be the most powerful moral ethical force in the country. Now, it is one thing to love your country. Jigme Kesa Namgyal Wangchuk has huge shoes to fill and an extraordinary legacy to live up to. Now, we've worked very hard. And today we can proudly say that the system that we've built, the unique and profound constitution that we've drafted, are as strong and as sound as possible. We are off to a very good start in our democracy. It is a time of transition for the monarchy. Its future will very much depend on the young and untested king. I think the essence of Bhutanese monarchy itself will not change. Because it's the relationship between the king and the people. You know, the king bestows his kindness on the people. People submit their loyalty to the king. And that is what we call the Bhutanese system. What has happened here is that at the, simultaneously at the same time, the king is not head of government, meaning he doesn't do the day-to-day -day planning of roads, schools, hospitals, and he's actually brought in a system, you know, called a democratic government, you know, a system including parliament and the judiciary and all that to actually perform that part of, uh, you know, governance. And whereas the king is there, still very much there, in touch with the people. So the king's... Uh, strength actually still comes from the will of the people, the love of the people. In village Bhutan, where most of the population lives, the earthquake of democracy has made little impact. Life goes on as usual, and the consensus is that if the king wants democracy, then who are the people to argue? And in the temples around Bhutan, the monks go about their daily business much as before, administering to the spiritual needs of the people. And Timpu's increasingly affluent and educated middle classes still enjoy a day out at the shrines and temples on the city's outskirts. Bhutan's culture is a village culture, and its monarchy is part of the everyday life of the village. I think one thing to appreciate, this is quite a small country with quite a small population. It's almost true to say everybody knows everybody else. Now, this makes it a family. And I think if one lives here or stays a long time here, you become acutely aware of how much a family it is. Well, now, as king, your father, you have a duty to the people, rather like the duty of a father to his children. And because it's a small country with a very family atmosphere, that sort of familial duty is very much reinforced. The close ties between the royal family and the people can be seen in the sports they play. The sport of kings, archery, is practiced by Bhutanese subjects with the same enthusiasm as their ruler. village culture, Buddhist faith, deference for the king. For now, these values still hold sway over the people. The impact of the modern world through tourists, television, and the internet will surely change Bhutan in some ways. But how it has changed is up to the people themselves, not just the Dragon King. It's not one man. It's the whole country. It's the women, the family system, which will carry the country. It will be the, the family, the unit of the family, which will maintain our culture. Over the last century, the Wangchuk dynasty has been ahead of their people, leading them forwards. Leaders see the present, great leaders see the future. And Bhutan has been lucky in that sense. And that's why Bhutan has survived through the ages. For Bhutan to continue its survival, the new king will have to demonstrate his political acumen and farsightedness, much like his predecessors. The fifth king will no doubt face both old and new challenges. 
His ability to handle them will contribute to the success of the monarchy. I want you to love your country in the most intelligent manner. You must always keep in mind that it is one thing to love your country, it is quite another to love it intelligently. The future of Bhutan's monarchy now rests in the hands of its young king, but more importantly, it rests in the hands of the Bhutanese themselves.